Hello and welcome. I am Professor Rashmi Raman once again and this is module 26 of our paper International Criminal Justice. This module is titled Landmark Decisions of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, the so-called ICTY, which you have encountered several times before in the foregoing modules. In this module, you will be introduced to the ICTY once again and to its functions and jurisprudence. You will also be expected to get yourself acquainted with the main actors in the Yugoslav war and to understand a brief summary of the atrocities that were perpetrated and committed during the course of the Yugoslav war. You will learn in depth about various cases that were tried before the Inter International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, including a few that were unprecedented in international law and set out some of the important principles of international criminal law. As we speak about the main cases, I will notify you about the significance of the tribunal and how its setting up has contributed to the future of the Balkans and the arbitration of such cases in the future in the Balkans area. Finally, I expect that through this module, you will begin to understand the peacemaking process in the Balkans. Now, as you already know, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was created in order to carry out legal functions and to institute proceedings against all the perpetrators and suspected war criminals of the Yugoslav war, which spanned the better part of the decade in the 90s. This tribunal set several important precedents, including becoming the first tribunal to try a hit sitting head of state uh, during the Slobodan Milosevic proceedings. Several high-ranking members of the government in the former territory of Yugoslavia were charged with crimes by the ICTY for their roles in the wars that led to the disintegration of the former state of Yugoslavia and the birth of the new six successor states that followed. Uh, the ICTY has been significant in several ways in that it has provided a forum to ascertain the exact events of a tumultuous decade in the Balkan Peninsula, the decade which witnessed great upheaval, significant bloodshed and a sea change in the geopolitical landscape of Europe. The tribunal has made accountable those who committed war crimes during those years. By doing so, it has strengthened the legitimacy of international law. And through this process, has interpreted principles that had not been used nor commented upon since the Nuremberg trials half a century before its creation. As all other creatures, it witnessed a fair share of criticism and rejection from certain quarters of the international community, which give the activities of the tribunal and its holdings, more importantly, a more divisive nature in that they talk about the fragmentation of society that was a social result of the legal proceedings at the tribunal. Let us begin with the case of Milosevic, referred to as a trial of the century. Slobodan Milosevic, the erstwhile president of Serbia and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, was indicted in 1999 by the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia on three counts of war crime crimes against humanity as well as genocide. The trial against Milosevic investigated allegations of human rights abuse carried out by Yugoslav forces in the region of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia and Kosovo under the orders of Serbian leader. Uh, the trial of Milosevic commenced on the 12th of February 2002 and continued until Milosevic's death under mysterious circumstances in 2006 while in trial. The charges against Milosevic followed that he had orchestrated the mass deportation of hundreds of thousands of Kosovar Albanians, ordered the mass killings of Croatian civilians constituting war crimes, along with the most serious allegation of genocide against Bosnians, mainly Muslims and Croats. The period of atrocities alleged against Milosevic stretched from 1991 
to 1999 and make this case a landmark case in the history of international law itself. The accused Milosevic was a qualified lawyer who insisted on defending himself throughout the duration of the hearing, although two counsels were forcibly appointed for him by the court against the wishes of all three individuals. The trial proceeded very slowly owing mainly to the repeated breaks taken by Milosevic for medical treatment and the absence of a so-called smoking gun. Radomid, Radomir Markovic, the head of the Yugoslav State Security Services, having initially provided a written statement implicating Milosevic um, in the atrocities carried out during the Yugoslav wars, later revealed in his testimony that the document he provided was procured under duress from NATO officers. This, of course, called into evidentiary uh, value the claim he presented. The prosecution presented their case over a span of two years, covering an in-depth detail of wars in Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo. And prosecution concluded its case on the 25th of February 2004. The next phase of the trial with Milosevic defending himself, began on the 31st of August 2004, 13 years before this module is being recorded. Numerous incidents disrupted proceedings, such as Milosevic refusing to cooperate with the lawyers assigned to him and carrying uh, Friedrich Naumann's Mittel Europa to court, which he used to allege that Germany desired the weakening and disintegration of Serbia. A political claim. Milosevic submitted a list of over 1,000 witnesses in his defense case and concentrated primarily on the charges filed against him with regard to activities in Kosovo. Slobodan Milosevic suffered from a persistent heart ailment and uh, high blood pressure throughout this period. The trial came to an abrupt end on a fateful day, the 11th of March. 2006, when Milosevic was discovered unconscious in his, in his uh, cell at the United Nations Tribunal Detention Center in The Hague. It was soon ascertained that the former Serbian leader had passed away from a heart attack. The circumstances surrounding his death were admittedly suspicious, um, with many suspecting foul play because of a request made by Milosevic a week earlier to his death that he be transferred to a specialized hospital in Russia and this uh, request was denied. The proceedings against him were formally closed on the 14th of the same month. The second important landmark decision of the ICTY that we will discuss here is another case that you have spoken about before. This is the Furun Zija case presided over by Judge Mohammad Shahabuddin and Lal Chand Vora, Rafael Nito Navia, Judge Patrick Lipton Robinson and Judge Fausto Pokar. The International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia is a United Nations court of law. Uh, as you know, this is a court which deals with war crimes and crimes against humanity as well as genocide, all of which ought to have been perpetrated in the context of the Yugoslav genocide. The Furun Zija suit was instituted in the court on the 21st of July 2000 in the appeals chamber. The defendant in the suit, who was previously uh, the applicant, was indicted by the trial chamber on three counts of crimes within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Trial chamber 2 found Anton Furun Zija guilty on both the counts, that is, as a co perpetrator of torture as a violation of laws and customs of war and subsequently as an aider and a better of outrages of personal dignity including rape. The suit instituted in the appeals chamber went through utmost scrutiny as the due diligence uh, by the respected bench involved questions of facts as well as of law. You might know that the trial chamber is tasked traditionally with being the finder of fact and the ap appeals chamber is the finder of law. This case went through five rounds of appeal followed by a disposition. 
the grounds of appeal included allegations that Furun Zija was denied a fair trial, that the conviction lacked any concrete evidence, along with contending that one of the judges had fulfilled grounds for disqualification and also that the sentence imposed was excessive. Thus, the relief sought by Furun Zija was for acquittal on the conviction or the authorization of a new trial and reduction of the sentence to a term of six years. Another question that was raised by the parties in the Furun Zija case was regarding the standard of review. This is the context in which you have studied this case before. The appeals chamber gave a clarification of what instances qualify for standard of review when it comes to questions regarding law and questions regarding fact. Article 25 of the Rome Statute limits the role regarding it. The question of law is addressed according to the argument of the parties and the contentions made by them. Whereas, as far as questions of fact are concerned, the appeals chamber relied on the test of reasonability. The acceptance of evidence by a reasonable person um, standard is the same standard that, apply, was, that was applied by the appeals chamber. The appeals chamber in Forunzija rejected all the arguments made by the defendant. They held that the various grounds of appeal in the Furunzija suit are not open to contention. And the chambers held that the appellant was not denied a fair trial and that the judge that they alleged uh, was in fact biased was free of bias and that the sentence imparted was appropriate in accordance to the, with the relevant provision of the rules and statutes as well as the gravity of the crime. Lastly, the appeals chamber stated that the appeals chamber rejects the ground of appeal, each ground of appeal and affirms the conviction uh, awarded by the trial chamber. The third case that we will talk about is also a case that we have discussed in previous modules. This is the case of Kunarak, prosecutor versus Kunarak, Fukovic and Kovac. The bench in this case was Judge Cloud Yorda presiding with Judge Mohammad Shahabuddin, Judge Wolfgang Skomberg, Judge Mehmet Guni and Judge Theodore Meron. Since its commencement as a court of law, the ICTY has investigated numerous instances of sexual violence committed in the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina from the year 1995 onwards. It has convicted about 30 individuals for crimes of sexual violence at least as of 2011. The ICTY has helped advance the ideas of international justice by enabling the prosecution of crimes of sexual violence as a counted crime in the chapeau of crimes against humanity. Rape and sexual violence are now perceived as weapons of war used to establish domination and intimidate the enemy or subjugate a population. This trial is an important contribution to international law as it was a second ICTY trial to solely address the issue of crimes of sexual violence perpetrated as a means of asserting power, asserting power during wartime or during genocide. Through this decision, the scope of the crime of enslavement as a crime against humanity was expanded to include within it sexual enslavement or sexual slavery. The accused in this case were three Bosnian Serb army officers, Dragoljub Kunarak, Zoran Fukovic, and Radomir Kovac, who were instrumental in the organization and running of numerous rape camps in the region of Foka in eastern Bosnia after it was occupied by Serb forces in 1992. Women in these camps lived in conditions of severe deprivation and enslavement. During the trial, the court heard testimonies from numerous women detailing the various instances and kinds of sexual violence perpetrated by the Bosnian Serb soldiers by against them. Muslim women were frequently gathered in hordes by Bosnian Serbs in detention centers across Foka and then raped repeatedly. 
Women were also taken to various apartments and hotels found around the town, which were run down and used as brothels for Serb soldiers. Women were not allowed to move freely and had to follow the commands of their captors, which included performing household chores. They were often sold by their captors to other men in the Bosnian forces. In pronouncing this landmark judgment, the ICTY convicted the three accused of rape as a crime against humanity for the first time in the history of international law and the history of the ICTY. Prior to this ruling, enslavement was always associated with enforced labor. The concept of slavery in this case was widened to include sexual slavery through this decision. Furun Zija helped the court acknowledge that in situations of attack and widespread subjugation, rape is often used as a mode of cleansing to drive people of a certain othered group out of the occupied territory. In this context, it was a tool to terrorize and drive out the Muslims from Foka for the, Bos for the Bosnian Serb soldiers. Like most cases of war, the rape of these Muslim women was also a symbol for the victory of the Serbs. For example, one of the survivors in her testimony said that the accused Dragolyub Kunarak, while raping her, said that she should enjoy, open quotes, being fucked by a Serb, close quotes, and that she would carry a Serb baby after this. On appeal in June 2002, the convictions were upheld and the accused Kovac, Kunarak and Vukovic were sentenced to 20, 28 and 12 years of imprisonment respectively. The next case that constitutes a landmark decision is the case of Dordovich. The bench in this case was Judge Kevin Parker presiding with Judge Christopher Flug Judge Melville Baird. Since its establishment, the ICTY has indicted over 160 individuals believed to have been involved in various crimes that are classified as serious violations of humanitarian law, which were committed in the territory of the former Republic of Yugoslavia between the years in the decade of the 90s. The Dordovich trial is one such case. This case relates to the conduct of one Vladimir Dordovic during the period 1st January to 20th June 1999 when he was the assistant minister to the Serbian Ministry of Internal Affairs. Indicted in 2003, Dordovic was later arrested four years after in 2007. Dordovich was sentenced to 27 years of imprisonment after the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia convicted him for the crimes of deportation and other inhumane acts such as forcible transfer and persecution on racial grounds as crimes against humanity and murder as a crime against humanity and the violation of the accepted codes of warfare. It was found in evidence that Dordovich had participated in criminal activities along with other people in order to alter the ethnic composition of Kosovo and to ensure the superiority of the Serbians in that region. Dordovich was charged for aiding and abetting these crimes. On appeal, the imprisonment was commuted to a duration of 18 years. He was transferred in the year 2014 to serve the rest of his sentence in Germany. The judgment in this case concluded that the indictment issued against 16 individuals for the crimes they committed in Kosovo should be punished. Yugoslavian and Serbian forces acting along with the support of Dordovic and his troops perpetrated the crimes which caused the expulsion of approximately 800,000 Kosovar Albanian civilians. These forced expulsions 
came out of an atmosphere of terror that was created through the use of force and violence. Dodovich and his team murdered numerous Kosovar Albanians and sexually assaulted the women who they left alive. Again, with the encouragement of Dodovich. Several monuments of cultural importance and several sacred sites of Muslim worship were also destroyed by the troops through bombings and through shootings by the Yugoslavian and Serb military forces. This atmosphere of intolerance, horror and regime of terror created by the Serbian forces forced many residents, former residents of Kosovo, to flee their homes. This process of internal displacement was facilitated by the Serbian forces through the organization of transport into the neighboring states such as Albania and Yugoslavia, what remained of it, Macedonia and Montenegro. This constituted the offense of deportation or forcible transfer of population. Through the collection of evidence, the ICTY found that most Kosovar Albanians were fleeing their homes out of fear or because they were forced to flee by Serbian forces. Dordovic argued in defense that these bombings, shootings and other criminal activities were all random acts of unconnected violence carried out by different individuals and that his own forces were only interested in attacking the terrorists who operated in Kosovo. However, the prosecution proved that this was unlikely as the scale of the actions of the Serbian forces could only have been carried out with such precision through the existence of a common plan or a common intent and Dordovich's participation in it was important to carrying out this common plan. Dordovich's government position gave him the power to exercise control over the police forces and he also possessed enough knowledge to engineer the carrying out of the attacks in the territory of Kosovo. Dordovich also failed to follow his official duties, firstly to report such crimes that he had the knowledge of and to investigate through due process um, thoroughly. As a result of these omissions as well as commissions, Dordovich was held responsible for his crimes. The next case that I would like to discuss with you is the case of Radislav Kristic. The bench in this case was Judge Almiro Rodriguez presiding with Judge Fuad Riyad, Judge Patricia Wald. Radislav Kristic, the Deputy Commissioner and Chief of Staff of a section of the Bosnian Serb Army, was appointed as a commander of the armed forces in July 1995. The Drina Corps, which Kristic was the commander of, was responsible for planning and executing Krivaha 95 or the plan on the area for attacking the region of Srebrenica. Kristic was indicted by the ICTY in 1998 for his role in the attacks on Srebrenica. Srebrenica was a predominantly Muslim area in 1995. The massacre killed over 8,000 civilians and is often considered one of the biggest standalone carnages in Europe since World War II. In an attempt to eliminate all Muslims from the region, Srebrenica was designated a safe zone by the United Nations in the region to keep civilians safe and to shelter them from the ongoing war. The forces of Kristic under the Drina Corps blocked all the humanitarian aid that was being sent to Srebrenica. Soon after, they began to separate the men from the women children and elderly. Women were then raped and killed while mass executions were carried out of the men. In one morning alone, 8,000 Muslim men and boys were lined up against a wall and shot to death. The trial chamber convicted Kristic of murder, persecution and genocide in August 2001. The decision was a landmark decision as it was the first instance that the ICTY unequivocally asserted that genocide had in fact been committed by Bosnian Serb forces in the territory of Srebrenica. 
Christich was also the first person to be found guilty of the crime of genocide by the ICTY. He was sentenced to 48 years of imprisonment. On appeal, the tribunal found that the genocide that had taken place in Srebrenica was only aided and abetted by Christich. His involvement in it was not direct. He knew of the plans to attack Srebrenica and that the nature of these attacks was discriminatory. In spite of this knowledge, he did not stop the forces. To this end, he was also convicted for being a participant in a joint criminal enterprise and a joint criminal campaign to commit genocide. His sentence was reduced by the appeals chamber to 35 years. In 2004, he was sent to carry out his sentence in Wakefield Prison, West Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. Christich was attacked in prison in 2010 by some of his Muslim inmates and was severely injured. The men who assaulted him were found guilty of wounding with the intent to kill and the intent to cause grievous bodily harm. But they, they were acquitted from the charge of attempt to murder. Christich was then transferred to a safe prison in the Netherlands following this and he was transferred again to Poland in 2014 where he currently serves out the remainder of his sentence. The next case I would like to discuss with you is the case of Prosecutor versus Tadic. This case has come up several times in preceding modules. Judge Mohammed Shahabuddin was the presiding judge along with Judge Antonio Cassesi, Judge Wang Tiea, Judge Rafael Nieto Navia, Judge Florence Netipele, Mochanda Mumba. The trial chamber had found the appellant guilty on nine counts and partly guilty on two counts, including crimes against humanity and breaches of the Geneva Conventions. The appellant, Dusko Tadic, had appealed on the ground that his right to fair trial had been violated, there being no equality of arms between the prosecution and defense, and that the trial chamber had erroneously decided that the appellant had committed certain murders. The defense raised the following grounds. One, that the trial chamber had erred in stating that the victims concerned did not enjoy the protection of the grave breaches regime of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Secondly, that the appellant, Dusko Tadic, ought to have been held guilty on counts 29, 30 and 31 of the indictment and that it had been wrongfully declared that in order to be guilty of a crime against humanity, the prosecution had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the offence had been committed with the knowledge of a systematic attack on the civilian population, the act not being motivated by purely personal reasons. Regarding the appellant's first grounds, the appeals chamber in The Hague accepted that the principle of equality of arms deserved a more liberal interpretation than the one upheld by domestic courts but concluded that the appellant could not substantiate that claim that he was not given a reasonable opportunity to present his case. With respect to the appellant's second grounds, the appeals chamber stated that the trial chamber's factual findings merited interference only when demonstrated that they were such as no reasonable man could have reached. As the appellant could neither prove that Mr. Tadic was a tainted witness or that Mr. Seferovi was a tainted witness and that his testimony was inherently implausible, there was no impediment to relying on the uncorroborated testimony of a witness. Based on these grounds, the appeals chamber held that the trial chamber decision in Tadic was correct and upheld the conviction. 
These have been some of the landmark decisions of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. In conjunction with the foregoing module, which tells us the landmark decisions of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and the coming module, which will tell us the landmark decisions of the International Criminal Court, these three modules together constitute your study of the jurisprudence of the tribunals most important cases. Thank you.